Hello, I'm Sarah and I run the Sales Academy for Girls, which, as its name suggests, teaches women how to sell. But it's not quite as sexist as it sounds because I maintain if you can walk five steps in heels, you're in. That's all it takes. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about today is a really interesting thing that's a real story, believe it or not, that happened with a client of mine. I have a number of different clients. A lot of what I do is online, but some of what I do is one-to-one. -one. And I have a client called Michelle. And Michelle had some pretty chunky um, sales targets that she wanted to hit. She was very determined. There was a very good reason. She had her why. You know, she was all fired up for this. And for the first two weeks of a six-week chunk of time, we clocked in every day. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I've done. It worked like magic. And in the middle of the third week, I got a text saying, can't talk to you today, be in touch. Roll on four or five days where I'd got her answer phone, no response to text messages. Oh, sorry, Sarah, give me five. It transpired that Michelle's sister-in-law's hamster had died. <laughs> You're laughing. <laughs> so was I, which was really unfortunate because she was quite upset about this. Now, the hamster, we're going to call him Hammy to protect the innocent. <laughs> <laughs> the hamster lived with the sister-in-law in Dundee. Now, I live a lot closer to Dundee than we are here. I live in Cumbria, but nevertheless, Dundee is a long way away. The sister-in-law's hamster handed in its knife and fork, and the sister-in-law was so distraught that the only person in the world that could possibly help her through this traumatic period in her life was her sister-in-law Michelle and so Michelle dropped everything and went driving up to Dundee to see the sister-in-law let's call her Bernadette went to see Bernadette and had to spend 10 days with her <laughs> I, I, you're telling me so I'm having this conversation and I'm thinking when is she gonna go ha ha and she didn't <laughs> Right, OK, let me have a think about this, Michelle. What you're telling me is you've taken 10 days out of your six-week period of time that you've got to achieve this goal. But, Sarah, it's really important. Right. We are talking about an ordinary hamster, you know, like the little rodenty things. Yes, she was very attached to it. I'm like, they live for 18 months, for crying out loud. You know, how attached can you get? To I mean, cute, they're cute. You know, they are cute. We all know they're cute. But really, 10-day mourning period for a hamster? We had a hamster. It got buried in the garden. You know, the daughter was sad for a little while, and then that was that. And this was devastating. Even more interesting, Bernadette's mum lives in Dundee. So the mother-in-law and the sister-in-law's mum live in the same town, but the mother-in-law wouldn't do. No, 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 you don't understand, Sarah. I'm always the one that people call when these things happen. I'm really, really good with upset, bereaved, really, grieving, really, people. Right, OK. And guess what? She didn't make a sales target. And guess what? Still cost her 1,500 quid working with me. I was still there. And guess what? She, play, she paid it happily. But guess what? She never did it again. She never wanted that one-to-one -one support because she knew in her heart of hearts that she'd let herself down. But she couldn't quite bring herself to accept it because she hadn't let herself down, had she? What she'd done was put her family first. That's important. What she'd done was was really important. She'd been a supportive sister-in-law. She dropped everything and run when called. And that's what we do, us women. We are nurturers. We are supporters. We have our place within a family. We are the ones who drop everything and run. Now, blokes often have particular roles within a family. It might be a salter outerer. Occasionally, they're the, you know, go and hold hands of people who are sobbing into tissues over hamsters. Not often. To be honest, I'm not a holder of a hand of people who are sobbing into tissues over hamsters, but Michelle is. Michelle is to the detriment 
of a very significant increase in her business had she achieved what it was she was going to achieve. And it got me thinking. It's the most sophisticated form of procrastinating that I've ever come across. We are very, very good at fooling ourselves. We fool ourselves better than we fool anyone else. And you know, you know when you listen to somebody talking absolute jollop, and you're standing there looking at them, you're thinking, are you saying this for me? Or are you saying this because you're trying to convince yourself? Because if it's for me, you can save your breath. I don't believe you. But people can get very defensive and very offended and can carry it on for a long time if you dare to say, hang on a second, you didn't have to drop everything and go racing off to Dundee to look after your sister-in-law whose hamster had died. You were scared because you were going to achieve that goal. No, I wasn't. I had, is the conversation you'll have. But it's true. You know, we procrastinate for all kinds of different reasons, but most of all, it's because we're scared of something. So emotional situations that press all our family buttons and all our I'm being an honourable person and this is very important to me, family first, and all of those things, it's actually a load of hogwash in these scenarios because what we're doing is scratching our own need not anybody else's, it was important to Michelle to be the one that was needed. So a combination of being scared that what she was doing was actually going to work and the fact that her want to be needed, her need to be needed, were both pulled together, that was a compelling reason for her to drop everything and run. It was such a good reason for her to drop everything and run. So if Being needed in a family, friends kind of a way is a really sophisticated reason or way of procrastinating, then how else do we procrastinate? Well, we procrastinate with other people's dramas. We're so good at getting involved with other people's dramas. Other people's dramas are better than ours because we get, it's like watching the telly, isn't it? You get all of the entertainment and none of the angst. But again, you might be the one that somebody wants to talk to at three o'clock in the morning. You might be the one, and we like it. We like to feel important. We like to feel like we are the one that that person wants to depend upon, whoever they are, whether they're family or friends or some randomer that you just happens to have. If you can be of help to them, you like it. And we can justify it forever. But do you know what? Somebody with a real goal, an absolute burning goal, isn't distracted by other people's crap. And I hate to trivialise it, but that's what it is nine times out of ten. I mean, sometimes, obviously, there's a curveball and it's a biggie and you do have to drop everything. And I I absolutely understand that. I have a a relative who has um, a really serious illness and when that kicks off, there's nothing that anyone can do. And those are times that you kind of have to almost plan into your diary, even though we never know when it's going to happen. It's a contingency thing. Hamsters, not so much. Yeah? Relationships breaking up, not so much. You know, I've, I've been through a divorce. It's awful. It's the worst. It was the worst time in my life I've ever been through. But it doesn't last forever. It's a period of time, and when it's done, it's done. And then you can kind of let go of that, put it there, and move along. If you have somebody who is sucking your energy because they're split up from their husband four years ago, and they still need to tell you that somebody saw him out with somebody else recently, that's you getting involved in their dramas. You don't need to be involved in their dramas. Let it go. You haven't got time for gossip, for emotional traumas for individual little details of nonsense like hamsters. 
and their funerals. You think I'm joking? I'm not joking. It's like, what did you bury it in? Was it like a shroud? Did you make a shroud out of loo roll or was it? A, a I shouldn't have asked. It didn't go down well. But all of that kind of small stuff, which feels big at the time, and this is how we manage to kid ourselves about it, is it feels big at the time. But if you have that really big why and that vision for your business or your personal goal, whatever it is, if you have that vision, you don't have time for the other stuff. You just don't have time. And then there comes a, a point where you don't have space for it either. You know, you don't have time because the time you spend on it is taken away from what it is you're trying to achieve. You don't have space for it because actually it sucks the living daylights out of you. You end up giving your time and energy to somebody else rather than to yourself. And I know you've heard it before, but this isn't a rehearsal. You know, we get one shot at this. And it's so easy to kind of tumble through life and get involved and, 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 and live in your own personal soap opera. But in managing your emotions and not allowing yourself to get sucked into everybody else's makes a massive difference to what you do. It makes a massive difference to how effective you are. Emotional traumas are sophisticated procrastinations. Who here procrastinates? Yeah, about that. <laughs> we all do it. We all do it. If you understand why you do it, it helps. And the, like I said earlier, the need thing combined with the um, fear of what, what happens if this actually goes well, or sometimes what happens, you know, if something's failing, if, if you've aimed for something and it's, you're not getting there, to get distracted by it because it's the wrong goal, it's too high and you don't believe in it, or it's too low and it's boring, or it just doesn't fit, to get distracted by the hamster is a natural thing to do, because it means you can stop with this stuff that's doing your head in because it's not working the way you wanted it to. It's really important that you make a distinction between you, your goals and your direction and the emotional stuff that goes on outside of you. So the other kind of emotional stuff is your emotional stuff. And that comes when people say things like, when are you going to get a proper job, Sarah? And you go, ouch. And it really hurts. It feels like a knife in the heart. And it steals your mojo. And you find yourself sitting there like this thinking, well, you know, the person who said that, I really respect them. I have a lot of time for them. And they wouldn't say it if they thought what I was doing was worthwhile. And all of a sudden, you end up in your own emotional story. And it gives you butterflies. It makes you feel sick. You hate it. You'd, all of that stuff. But what you need to remember in that case, when your mojo's being thieved, is that the person who said it doesn't get what you do. The person who said it isn't an expert in what you do, almost certainly, otherwise they wouldn't have said it. And I bet you, if you have a conversation with that person, they'll say things like, what you need is a steady job with a regular income, a bit of security. Now, forgive me, but the only steady jobs I've ever had and the only security I have ever had have been when I've worked for myself. Because I know I can keep it going. I know if I want that fridge full, to use the analogy from earlier, I can do it. How many of us know somebody who's been made redundant? How many of us know lots of people who've been made redundant? How's that a steady job? You know, my mum, who's in her 70s, thinks I'm insane because I don't have a steady job and will regularly say things like, when are you going to get a proper job? You know, now you're a single mum, you need a regular income. And that's just another side of managing your emotions. You get to the point where you go, right, oh mum, yeah, yeah, I'll have a look for a job. Okay, of course I will. 
And so that particular knife in the heart has gone for me because it's been said so often it's a standing joke. Yeah, yeah, you want me to get a proper job. But when people are important to you and they make comments like that, it makes you go, ouch. And what you must remember is that people who are lifelong employees will never get it. They will never get where you are. So don't ask them what they think you should do. Don't ask them. Come talk to somebody in 4N. Come talk to somebody who's self-employed. If you are ever in a situation where you're thinking, I need to get a job, go and talk to somebody in 4 Phone me up. Take my number. I'll tell you why you don't want to do that. Managing your emotions and not getting sucked into other people's dramas, allowing yourself or creating for yourself, should I say, a little bit of a buffer zone between the people who love you and want the best for you and your feelings. You need a buffer zone that's about the same length as the knife. <laughs> so when they say things to you and you think, ouch, just increase that buffer zone a little bit. They mean well, but they don't get it. Who would want to be employed when you can do your own thing, in your own time, always, and dictate what you earn? That, for me, is security. Thank you. Smile, be chat, join for networking.